This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yoon at the Sakasana United Methodist Church, September 25th, 2022. The message is, Essential Ingredients of Nourishing Disciples 3, based on Deuteronomy 6, 4-12, and Hebrews 5, 13-14. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord our God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be, are to be on your hearts. Impress them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk around the world, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bend, and bend them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities. You did not build houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, whilst you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves. You did not plant then when you eat and are satisfied. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant Use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's good to be with you. Would you join me as I pray? The bread of life, living water, we come to you asking for your divine mercy, love, trusting that your grace is sufficient each day, each moment. As we come to you this morning, as we come into your presence, O oh God, fill our heart, fill our soul with the food that you prepared for us this morning. Give comfort to those who are grieving. Give peace to the distressed. Give guidance to those who feel lost in their lives. Come, Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and minds to your life-giving, life-transforming word. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Someone says, I'm on my seafood diet right now. How does it work? Ask his friend. Whenever I see food, I eat it. If you don't get it, <laughs> it was a joke, by the way. Yes. Has any of you done this diet before? Seafood diet? Yeah. Yeah, right? then you would know the problem with this diet, seafood diet. We know some food is highly processed, high in protein, calories, but low in nutrition. Usually high in added sugars and salt and trans fat. What do we call this kind of food? Junk food, right? Junk food. Some food may increase the risk of diseases like allergies or even cancer. Through frequent frequency matters when it comes to the impact of this unhealthy food on our health, our body. We've all heard enough about how eating a healthy, uh, uh, you know, good quality food can affect our body. 
and how eating a poor quality food can affect our health negatively, how the consumption of unhealthy food is linked to a higher risk of health problems. These suggest that what we cook, what we eat have health implications. As scientists explain, it can affect not only our energy level, our overall body functions, but also our mental health and our immune system. I'm sure you all heard the phrase, you are what you eat. I'm trying to find the um, clicker. It's over there. Yes, thank you. I'm sure you, how many of you heard this phrase? Yeah, many of you. I am what I eat. And you are what you eat. Which was first coined by a French lawyer in 1826. In his writing he wrote, tell me what you eat, I'll tell you what you are. It means that the food you put in your body today impacts your health well-being tomorrow. Unfortunately, it's one of those phrases that gets said so often and frequently and that it loses its meaning and power. But if we stop to think about what happens to the body we eat, we can, we can see how true that statement is. I don't know what you ate before coming to church. Grace, what did you eat before you come to church? Donuts, yeah, okay. I love donuts. But do you know what happened to the donut you ate? It was broken down into tiny pieces, right? And digested in your body, providing energy for the activity that you do. Here in worship and throughout the day, it affects your physical, mental activity. In this way, we are quite literally made up of all we eat. And this old saying reminds us of how important it is to be mindful of what we eat, what we feed our bodies with. Of course, we get that intellectually. We know it's true. Many of you, including our Sunday school children, could probably recite the recipe for healthy diet. More fruit, vegetables, less lead meat, processed food. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But according to a recent journal article published by Harvard Medical School, many Americans are still struggling to follow healthy diet. Why? I mean, everyone seems to know they should eat healthier, but then why do we have a difficult time doing it? There are many reasons behind it, personal, cultural, economic, the market force, our lifestyle, but one of the most fundamental reasons is that people don't prioritize what they eat. Eating is often an afterthought. For many, eating is not a priority. Everything else seems more important, more urgent. It's something that we do because we have to. And this leads us to put ourselves in cycles of unhealthy eating and healthy habits over and over and end up not nourishing our bodies the way we deserve. As Ramini uh, de Basola, clinical psychologist, professor at California State University, noted in her book, we should first come to terms with why we eat, even before considering what we eat. By the way, the title of her book is You Are Why You Eat. The reason matters. I believe the same is true for our spiritual health. Friends, what goes into your mind and heart becomes part of who you are. 
Have you ever heard that the oldest computer can be traced back to Adam and Eve? I know some of you are loyal Apple users. Surprisingly, the oldest computer was an Apple, but with an extremely limited capacity, memory, just one byte. <laughs> and then everything crashed. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please go back and read uh, Genesis chapter 3. What happened to the humanity after, you know, eating the forbidden fruit, which was not an apple, actually. What goes into your mind and heart becomes part of who you are. If you put in good, healthy stuff, you will be good and healthy. If you put in less than that, your spiritual well-being will show the dysfunction of a, such a diet. Friends, I want to ask you this question this morning. What is your soul eating and digesting today? As you are worshiping this morning, as you come to God's presence here, what are you eating? What is your soul eating and digesting? I invite you to answer this question as you listen to this sermon and think about it throughout this week. This question leads us to the third essential ingredient for nourishing disciples, eating the Word of God. Eating the Word of God. In his conversation with God, the prophet Jeremiah said, when your words showed up, I ate them. He said, he literally said, I ate the Word of God when they showed up. I swallowed them whole. This is a metaphor to express how seriously he took the word of God. God wants to ingest good and healthy and spiritual food for our soul. And then, and then his message becomes a part of who we are, observed into our being, getting into our spirit, the depth of our spirit. Remember the story of Jesus where he rebuked the devil after uh, fasting for 40 days, he was tempted by the devil in the desert. And the devil told Jesus to turn a stone into a loaf of bread. What did Jesus say? Remember? Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. In this story, Jesus teaches us that it takes more than bread to stay alive. As God's children, we need more than bread, the physical bread, to stay, live, stay alive. It takes a steady stream of words from God's mouth daily. In this sermon series, we envision God cooking and serving in the kitchen. That's the title of this sermon series, God in the Kitchen. Our God is busy in the kitchen preparing a meal for us, for each of us here. A couple weeks ago, I read an article about a chef named Alice Waters living in the Bay Area, California, Berkeley, California. And her story uh, gave me a, a new perspective on what our God, the divine master chef, would do to nourish our mind and body and spirit. So this chef, Ellis, works in a restaurant in the Bay Area, which was made famous and popular by her. What was interesting to me was how she determines the evening menu, her evening special. Each morning, she would go to the farmer's market, the fish market, before the restaurant is open. She would look over the fresh produce and see what has been caught in, at, the, at the fishing market, and based on these freshest ingredients she gets there, she determined what her evening menu. This means her menu is determined at the market. Our God, Divine Master Shab, also comes to the market each day. He comes to our life, our life circumstances, our life context, where we and look over our lives filled with changes and challenges, sorrows and joys, moments of success and failure. He comes 
looks over our lives and determines the menu for us, the, the best nutritious, nutritious meal that our soul requires today. And I believe, I believe that's what God is doing here today. Preparing a meal and feeding a meal that you need today. It's a fresh meal for the day. This means you've got to go to God's restaurant every day. You've got to go to God's kitchen every day to be fed with His Word. Not just on Sunday. Not just when you feel like it. You've got to go every day. When the people of Israel were in the wilderness, God provided them with manna. Remember the story? Manna was like a bread coming down from heaven like rain. And the people went out each day, gathered only enough for the day. Not for tomorrow, not for the next week, just for the day. They were not supposed to keep them until the next day even. What do you think this daily rhythm or practice meant to them? What does daily practice teach them? It meant that God is the one who provides each day. God provides us each day. And they should be fed with God's word that comes fresh each day as they walk with him. Every day. Not waiting until tomorrow or next month. Today. So friends, how are you doing with eating the word of God? Which is the essential ingredients we're talking about today. How does this essential ingredient shaping your faith journey? The journey of your children. Are you intentional about eating the word of God that would feed your soul each day? The pastor theologian Eugene Peterson, or Peterson wrote a book entitled Eat the Book, which is uh, directly from the book of Jeremiah talked about, you know, when Jeremiah said, I ate the word of God. I swallowed them a whole, which was Jeremiah's metaphor. In his book, he proposes that Christians should read and meditate the word of God like a dog. Those of you who raise a dog would know how much dog loves bones. Dog would turn it over and around, lick it and chew it over and over. He or she might bury it after playing with it for a couple of hours, but then return the next day to take it up again. And that's what my dog Gracie does. I bought a new a bone for, him, for her, and it disappeared out of sudden, and it comes back. We don't know where, where she's hiding it, but it shows up mysteriously the next day. The Hebrew word translated as meditate is haga, which originally refers to the image of a lion chewing, swallowing, and digesting what he ate by using teeth, tongue, and stomach, and, and intestines, just like a dog chewing on a bone. Our practice of eating the Word of God should be like a lion or dog who meditates on a bone. We need time to listen to the Word of God, a time to contemplate the Bible. And I hope and pray that this Sunday is not the only day for you to try to listen and meditate on the Word of God. You know, we have a various Bible study opportunities throughout the week. Tuesday, when, Tuesday Adult Bible Study. Wednesday, we have Wednesday Bible study at this point. We have Saturday men's Bible study. We have adult Sunday school at between the services. We have many opportunities to, to learn and study and grow in understanding the Word of God. There are lots of spiritual benefits when we study the Scripture together in a group. Study with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Think about a potluck meal like international dinner that we are planning to hold in October. You know, you bring your own dish, but when everybody gathers, it turns into a 
banquet, right? Just like the Bible study we have together as a church family. You bring your own experience, your faith journey, and when you share it with others, it turns into a banquet. It, it, it's, it's so rich and deep to hear from others, to share your faith with others. There are so many tools available for us and for our children, grandchildren. When it comes to studying the Bible, you see uh, Mary Chowen did a wonderful job decorating this altar table. There are so many tools we use for cooking when we cook. You know, we use different tools, utensils. When it comes to learning and studying the Bible, there are so many different tools. How many of you have a, at least one Bible commentary in your house? The Bible commentary, which is, what is Bible commentary? It gives you an interpretation or traditions of interpretation of the scripture. It gives you a, a, a guide. How do, how do I understand this passage? It gives you a, a, a guidelines. So commentary is, a, is one of the essential tools. How many of you have a Bible dictionary? Okay, Bible dictionary gives you the definition of certain terms you find in the Bible. If you are not sure about it, use Bible dictionary. How many of you have a study Bible? There's different kinds of study Bible. Wonderful, yes. If you don't have one, no worries. We have the uh, wonderful library here in the church created uh, in honor of Jane Hopper. We have a, a lot of good resources there, Bible dictionaries, commentaries. Come, check that out. These tools help us understand the historical, cultural gap between the biblical time and us. Help us understand what God is speaking to us today. As you seek to feed your soul with the Word of God each day, friends, I encourage you to make sure that your children and grandchildren and new disciples in our church are eating the Word of God each day. I want to encourage you to help them to build a daily routine to eat the Word of God. If you don't want to talk about faith, especially the importance of eating the Word of God with your kids and fear that your kids will reject it completely. If that is the case, imagine a child who says, I cannot believe it. My parents force me to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner three, three times a day. Every single day, no joke, I don't like it. The meals she cooked always included vegetables. I didn't like it. Those boiled carrots, broccolis are gross. I hate those stuff, so I made an important decision. If I grow up, become an adult, I will not eat every day. No daily eating. I'm done with it because I'm sick of it. I'm done with the vegetables just because my parents forced me to eat them. Are we really afraid of this scenario, friends? What we should be more concerned about is the reality. The reality that there is a lot of spiritual junk food out there in this world. The spiritual junk food that are feeding the hearts and minds of our children. The menu is full, it looks and tastes great, but it's not very good for them. It is all you eat, it won't take long until you are spiritually imbalanced. Only in eating right, taking God's message into our hearts and lives, we can hope to be transformed and grow spiritually. The same is true to our soul and the soul of our children, grandchildren, and new disciples. This is why we don't want to miss God's special menu prepared for us each day. This is why we shouldn't let our children, grandchildren miss theirs and, and take junk food in our spiritual sense. 
So how can we help them to take these daily spiritual meals as frequently as possible? How can we guide them in accepting the Word of God so the truth of God truly becomes what they are, who they are? Remember what you eat becomes what you are? Toby and Lily, the Dussinger family, share their own recipe this morning through their testimony. And I invite you to share your own recipe on the post-it note that you received this morning. And place it on this Connect banner after the service. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God reminds us that the people of Israel needs to be fed with God's word, God's commandment each day in, in, in various different ways. It is written, love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love Him with all that's in you. Love Him with all you've got. And it goes on to say, say this, write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and then get them inside your children. Talk about them whenever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into the bed at night. Tie them on your hands, foreheads. As a reminder, inscribe them on the doorstep of your homes and your city gates. One of our church families shared a... Um, Posting note that was written by her mom. Her mom passed away recently, and she shared the photo of the posted note that her mom wrote. On the posted note, there was a Bible passage. She wrote down the passage and put it in her house to remind herself of the God's word each day. In this passage, you see the, 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 the word, the door post, door, door frames. And this refers to uh, the Passover uh, in, in Exodus. Exodus 12, 7 says, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. It alludes to what happened to the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. In the Bible study, uh, we, we talked about this Passover, uh, this past Wednesday, we had a Passover Seder meal. The Hebrew word Seder means an order. It means order. It's a meal that has given the people of Israel an order. In the midst of all the chaos, all the disorder, the disorderliness that they experience in their journey. Importantly, a Passover meal was a family meal. It was observed from generation to generation for the almost 3,000 years. They passed along their faith in God by sharing this biblical story with their children and grandchildren. In the same way, Jesus, the Lamb of God, gives us the new Passover, saying that His work on the cross was not only for that generation, but should be remembered and applied to all generations. Friends, you know what you eat is so important. It's one of the few things we really have control over when it comes to our physical, and spiritual well-being. What we eat is going to directly affect us and our family. Every moment of our lives is spent in these bodies, and it doesn't matter where we are and what we are doing. How we feel inside out will always be present. We have the opportunity to do what we can for our body and soul to live a to live an abundant life in, in God and live up to what God called us to be. So today, my brothers and sisters in Christ, what would you feed you and your children? You are what you eat. 
You are why you eat. Amen?